You gentlemen may not know this. However, I do because I looked it up. It was on this date, 753 B.C., when Romulus founded Rome. That was 2,776 years ago. And it was also on this day in 1509 that King Henry VIII ascended the throne of England. Because of that history, I have painstakingly done my research on the greatest emperors and kings of the free world over the course of the last 276 years, and I have come up with your special tailor-made intros for today. I know as you sit there in eager anticipation, and we go a little something like this, hit it. And here we go. All right, now I will begin the day's festivities with you, Mr. Height. <clears throat> this guy was an emperor, and he got a bad rap for conquering a big chunk of the European map. History says he was about 5'6", and that ain't very tall. But if he conquered your country, you didn't think he was so small. He knocked off Great Britain, much of Italy and Russia. He tore through Austria, Sardinia, and Germany, then called Prussia. He got banished to Elba and ultimately escaped with a fresh start. If Mike Height was an emperor, I believe he'd be Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> For you, Mr. Carr, I looked up King Michael and only found one in history in Romania. But in Sweden, there's been 16 King Carls to contribute to that insania. So forget the kings and leaders who a similar name they once took. And instead, let's find a president who once said, I am not a crook. This guy once served in the Nixon White House some 50 years ago. So in honor of Mike Carl, today I will erase 18 and a half minutes from the show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. <laughs> Mr. Schultz. T'was on this day in 1509 he ascended to the throne, the eighth of those Henrys with an axe he did hone. All the man wanted was a queen to bear him a son. Through six wives he went, and still he had none. Old Henry and Larry Schultz, they just wanted to win. Wait a second. Does that make Stacy Schultz and Bolin? <laughs> Thanks for being here and I'm not answering that. <laughs> I'm going off the board for this guy, no emperor or king, because when your name ends in a vowel, you do your own thing, you get your own letterhead, and you get your own heading, and you don't turn down a request on the day of your daughter's wedding. On this 2,776 year anniversary of Romulus founding of Rome, for Joe Joey Toots Freddy, I choose for him as a leader, Don Corleone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me let me just say, uh, Remus demands equal time. Remus will get his next week. <laughs> this is Romulus's day. <laughs> Previously, I sent him back in time to fight the Roman Senate to give to Caesar what was Caesar's, and then keep the rest and spend it. If I was true to that movie, I'd have him fighting Libyans. But as a geologist is on the high seas, he'd probably prefer to hang out more with ocean-dwelling amphibians. But there's neither of those here, so to that duty I'm bereft. Instead, what Bill Stubblefield gets today is Mike Carl to his right and Larry Schultz to his left. <laughs> Good morning, Apple. Feel right at home. <laughs> Very nice, Rob. And on that note, we turn it over to Joe. Joey Torts Freddy is our lead off hitter on a day when the Pittsburgh Pirates sit with a 650 winning percentage of 13 and 7, Joe. <laughs> Strange days indeed. Um, Rob. We uh, at the Tuscarora Rotan Club each year give out a $1,000 scholarship to a local high school student who has, exhibits academic excellence and also understands the importance of being an American citizen. And we ask them to write an essay, The Responsibilities of an American Citizen. What we've received over the last 15 years or so when I have reviewed applications there's a lot of talk about voting and, and uh, jury duty, paying your taxes, picking up trash, and, and all those things that we know people do to, to be a, a, con a contributor to society. But we don't see and we don't expect, because these are 17 and 18-year-olds, the deep thinking involved in what I guess we have to be concerned about in this day and age, about how we become a good American citizen in the way we consume our news. We know the news and the media shapes our thinking. It dictates to us in many ways what the issues of the day are. And we have seen 
just in this past few days uh, the settlement of a landmark case, a case that will be taught in law schools for the next 50 years about how a major news organization essentially lied to its viewers to get profits. And they were terrified of their audience and chose to give the audience what they wanted rather than what they really needed, which was the news. So I was thinking about this issue and and trying to figure out, and I, I kind of pose a broad-based question this morning, how big of a problem does the Fox News case reveal to us? How important should we treat this new the the development of this case and understanding that it's not limited to fox i understand that and i don't want to go down that path there's other news organizations who uh who, who certainly fail much like fox did uh, but how big of an issue is this for us to grapple with is it the cause of polarity in our society and what can we do to address it should we teach as a conscious effort in our schools how to seek out different points of view, different sources of news. Should we consider a reinstitution of the fairness doctrine, which has pretty much been abrogated now in, in our law and is not a guidepost for these media outlets? What can we do about this? How important is this case? And how important is it to us to also be good, responsible American citizens? All right, Joe, let's start with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, the voice of reason in the room, William. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joe, you've raised a, a, a question I think a lot of us have been wrestling with. Who do we turn to for the news? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion the last couple of so days who benefited with the settlement between Dominion and Fox and who did not benefit. Uh, I think the two parties that benefited with both Dominion and Fox uh, for for their respective uh, positions. I think the group that did not benefit were the American people that could see an inside of what was a, what was presented and what was actually done. I think you, if we had gone through a court trial, you could have just as easily uh, written in MSNBC along with Fox and other networks as well. So as you pointed out, it's not unique to Fox. But what has resulted from the settlement is people are going to go on business as usual. I don't think there's going to be any far-reaching uh, changes made. Certainly the American people are not going to be exposed up front and uh, close and up front about the difference between what was said in private and what was said in public. And if you looked at some of the emails, uh, there was a, a, a major departure from what was presented and to what they actually felt. So you summed it up, I think, doing it for profit. I think what Fox did and what the other networks are doing as well are are foregoing the truth and objective, honest presentation of the truth for the sake of the almighty dollar. All right, let's go to the voice of reason in the room, Mike Carl. Thank you for the introduction. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> Maybe not well-deserved, but um, I, I, I think this is all overstated. I don't think this is anything new. There's been bias in the media, uh, which is just tailoring messages and twisting the news stories to a particular audience that they're trying to sell their subscriptions to and uh, i don't think and, and but at the same time i think the free enterprise system and and, and no greater you know uh, advocate and leader of it than rupert murdoch will uh be very restrained i mean i think i think it'll be a, a three quarters of or even more of a billion dollars that you know even to him is noticeable to pay out and i i i think there will be a uh, restraint i mean i've i've been internally restrained all the time uh, you know at eight o'clock i'd turn off fox because of tucker carlson i've been doing that anyway so if he was playing to me as an audience he 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 wouldn't have him on let's go to the voice of reason in the room larry schultz uh yeah the, these are interesting cases and it's not over you know dominion also named a number of individuals whose names would be recognizable and you can change the conduct 
of Rudy Giuliani probably more quickly with a lot smaller number than it takes to change the conduct of Rupert Murdoch. And so some of that is still going on. Plus, there's also the Smartmatic, which is a software company whose software was apparently used with Dominion. Um, that being said, I do see a difference between what Fox did over these years and what other news organizations do. I don't see NPR making up facts about a failure of our constitutional system of choosing a, a, a president or a government. Um, that's what Fox did. And to some extent, Fox uh, was used as a platform to drive the January 6th uh, uh, rebellion uh, at the Capitol and the uh, stuff that happened there, which is is a significant item that's going to go down in history in a way that a lot of other things, you know, the the Nicholas Sandman case, uh, the young man who was uh, staring down or whatever, the Native American fella, that resulted in NBC News or one of them paying uh, some damages. And uh, that was, that didn't bother me that that happened. But that's not a sweeping national constitutional issue and so uh, i hope this is going to go on and i hope that uh, people will here's one thing you can do to immediately even up your view start choosing to read more than watch tv when you read the you know each person reads things a little differently we all hear things a little differently but reading in particular it's right there in front of you what the words say is right there and you can go back and read it again if you don't understand it and all of us have gotten away from reading to get our news and i do think uh that there's a difference between fox news and either the new york times or rupert murdoch's wall street journal um, there's a difference of kind in television versus uh, reading. And so um, th that's what I try to do is to try and read uh, major newspapers and magazine articles uh, to get a more balanced view. It's harder. And a more make, thorough. Yeah, it's harder to make that sort of unmitigated lie stick when it's in writing. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe critical thinking is more involved when you're reading as opposed to just watching TV interspersed with detergent commercials. I don't know. But uh, I think it is a better way to consume news. Well, TV news has to be done in a package that fits a time format, and uh, you can leave a lot of stuff on the editing room floor. Newspaper articles tend to be more thorough, longer, more uh, in-depth. Fourth voice of reason in the room, Michael Height. So to answer Joe's original question, you know, what makes a good American, I would say responsibility and accountability. Um, we talk about rights all the time as American. With rights come responsibilities. And we have the responsibility to be open-minded and listen to both sides of an issue. And that's one of the things we don't do anymore. We, 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 we hunker down and we either, either listen to Fox News or we listen to MSNBC or CNN or something. And we only see one side of things. And as responsible adults, we need to listen to both sides. The other important thing is we need to realize that these 24-hour news networks are not spewing news for 24 hours most of these shows are opinion pieces uh the tucker carlson is an opinion piece the all of the ones from about seven o'clock on in the evening whether it's cnn or fox or msnbc are opinion pieces and and they need to be taken as that this is not news um they're they're playing to their base they're trying to get their base riled up and that's all it really is if you want to listen to news go to the regular networks go to the newspapers um npr to an extent i don't know that i totally agree with you npr is slighted left a little um but if you want to get the news then you have the responsibility to go out and find the news 
and be and find both sides of a story don't just take everything for face value value and certainly don't just listen to the opinion pieces every evening and take what they're saying at, at face value either look at both sides of a story May I ask Mike a quick question? And I and <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, and I agree <laughs> with I agree with I, I view NPR as being the more objective of all of them, and yet you're making a point that I've heard before that it is biased slightly to the left. Is there some is there a network equivalent to NPR that is slightly biased to the right? Slightly biased to that would be the right. NPR equivalent. That'd be equivalent to NPR. No, um, I, I think there's only one that goes anywhere to the right, mm. and that's Fox. And they probably mm. go a little too mm. far to yeah. the right. Um, I have heard from different. I don't listen to it a lot, but yeah. I've heard a lot of people say BBC is the best place mm. to get news. Yeah. So yeah. I, okay. I don't know. Okay, Joe, let's go back to you here for a moment because uh, Mike Height making the point that uh, what you're hearing and seeing on Fox News after a straight newscast, for instance, is opinion and uh, not being presented as, as fact. Do you agree with that's how this whole Dominion voting situation and the election of, uh, of Joe Biden to the presidency was presented as opinion or as uh, fact? Well, I, I don't think there's any dispute that what you see uh, late at night on Fox News is different than what you see earlier in the day. Brett Baer, I believe, is an excellent journalist I agree. and newsman and i watch his show uh, i purposely seek it out because i don't want to be uh just confined to getting news from cnn or msnbc I, I i do try to seek out alternative viewpoints and i think brett bear does an excellent job i think they go off the rails at night and if you compare what they're doing at night to another murdoch enterprise which is the wall street journal which somebody else mentioned this morning uh, there's a vast difference in terms of how they present the news. Uh, but, look, the viewership at night is tremendous versus what the viewership is at 6 or 7 o'clock when Br Brett Baer is on Fox and when uh, the other shows are broadcasting their news and then they have their opinion people at night. The viewership is much greater later at night because that's when people have finished their day and sit down and watch television. But these are all excellent points that are being raised this morning. Larry Schultz hit the nail on the head about reading. Uh, and again, case in point, the Wall Street Journal. I know Mike Carl reads that religiously and gets a lot of his news from the Wall Street Journal. I would encourage others to do so also because it is much more fair and balanced, to bother, borrow a phrase, than what you see on television. And it's, it, it allows you time to think. And it's not chock full of imagery and other things to, to kind of sway your mind. Uh, excellent point there. And, and also the, the point about, you know, what we should be doing in our schools, perhaps, to teach how to be a good American citizen. Our civics teachers should be teaching this, that to seek out alternative viewpoints so that the polarity we suffer in society is not being just reinforced at night. But people are understanding that, hey, I, I can't confine myself to just one news outlet. i got to seek other viewpoints so that I know both sides of the issues and can argue and present them well. I think we can start with our youth to help combat this problem. And finally, you know, Byron Wizzer White in 1969 in a federal case challenging the Fairness Doctrine, which the Supreme Court upheld in a vote of eight to zero, said that without this doctrine, station owners would only have people on air who agree with their opinions. That was in 1969. And here we are today with a major news organization paying almost a billion dollars for doing exactly that. I, I, I think I, as much as I abhor uh, some of this regulation uh, that we have at the federal government level, these are FCC licensed organizations. They are subject to regulation. And I think we should revisit in some respects, not all, but some respects, the fairness doctrine. I think a combination of teaching and regulation can help us combat this problem, which I, I think is a major contributor to what we are experiencing in our society. You know, back during the Reagan administration when I was um, – still without gray hair 
for a while. Uh, back during the Reagan administration, we used to hear all the time that all the news was biased to the left. And I can remember saying to friends of mine who said that to me, well, there's no blockage. There's lots of rich conservative guys. Why don't they start their own radio show or TV show? And eventually we got Fox News. Um, I mean, it was always a free market. I never understood how you would say, well, uh, it's, it's biased. But when you combine that with collapsing the fairness doctrine, what you end up with is things that look like news that are actually not just opinion, but it, but loopy, unprovable opinion about facts that can't be tolerated. And, and so, you know, there's not a bright line between fact and opinion. Sometimes the facts you adopt are a product of your opinion. But have, and, have, and, have we drifted from the opinion in certain cases to propaganda? Oh, I, I, I think, but I mean, th- that's the, that plays on the same dividing line where you can make opinion look like fact. And it's just opinion. And in fact, the basic facts underlying that opinion are often false, as we found in this case. There was no election fraud. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm old school, but I would have wished that the judge would have said, okay, you can have the settlement, but there's one other thing. I need each one of these people to go on national television in their usual hour and say, there was no fraud. <laughs> there was no election fraud. No matter how many times you heard me say it, I was wrong, quote unquote, and there was no fraud. That didn't happen because they settled the case. Smartmatic may say, you know what, we're just going to run it through and see what happens. And it would be interesting to see what a jury does left to their own devices in a Delaware state court. It would have been a lot more fascinating had this gone to trial. Yes. As opposed to being settled, which I think we probably all expected it to be settled. Or did we? Did we? I don't think anybody thought it was going to be settled until the day, the night before. There's an interesting piece of a um, um, mediator coming in, being called in. He was actually on a cruise boat on the Danube. And, uh, and so over by Zoom calls, telephone calls, on, in, from a hotel room, from the cruise boat on the Danube, he was able to pull the two sides together. Nobody thought they were going to get a settlement. I thought it would be settled just because there would be so much money in the settlement. Why go to trial and risk yeah. that much money because of how much money was at stake? If you're Rupert Murdoch, you're a businessman, you're going to say, what's the better here, 1.6 or about half of that? And you, you keep, by settling, at least the, the idea is you keep all that terribly damaging deposition testimony well, from not only Rupert but all his uh, people at Fox. The problem is Smartmatic saying, Okay, well, that proves our case, too. <laughs> yes. It's not over. <laughs> and so maybe the, the lawyers for Smart Medical say, we don't need, need a settlement. We, we've got all this evidence and the proof of the earlier settlement, which is basically an admission, even though they say it isn't. Um, and so, yeah, I could see that other one going to trial. That would be fun. Has anybody at Fox lost their job over this? Uh, early they did, yeah. yeah it's two or three very early in the process, but not. Yeah, not, Dan, Dan, yeah. Uh, Dan Bongino has been yeah. axed, uh, and and he was one of the more vociferous uh, guys regarding election fraud. And reportedly this morning, Maria Bartiromo and Janine Pirro uh, could be on the chopping block. Well, Dan Bongino, they, they said that that had nothing to do with that. That that was they couldn't reach an agreement. To extend his contract, it was a contract negotiation failure. It didn't have. Any, they even let him have his last show after they they couldn't reach the agreement. So I don't think that had anything to do with with this. Uh, but sometimes those contract negotiations, uh, you know, different sounds like things bad are, timing. Are, are, it, it, yeah, yeah it, it, well, they, <laughs> and they might have made him a contract offer that was was uh, uh, such that he was not going to accept it. You know, the easy way to get rid of them I, I i don't know the uh, depth story behind it but uh, i i thought you know, since he was one of the more boisterous guys regarding election fraud it was interesting that he was 
That was announced he was let go. It's, I'm a little disappointed because it seems like the only three heads that rolled were people whose names ended in a vowel, and all of them ended in the letter O. So I'm a little disappointed. I think, Joe, we need to look into this here. Bongino, Bartiromo, and Piro. I don't know. This, uh, this is old school anti Italian that like defamation league. Joe Colombo stuff here, baby. I could have saved both sides a lot of attorney fees by firing them people before it ever started. Hey, those, those were the true winners, the attorneys, and all of this. Those are who won. And once again, the Italians are the losers in this negotiation. We have uh, on the clock Bill Stubblefield. We move on to uh, issue number two, and for that we start with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Rob, we all recognize and appreciate that security in our schools is important, paramount. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper and you see these horrible events that's happened at, uh, various, uh, throughout the country. Uh, this past week, uh, Thursday, uh, Wednesday and uh, Thursday, you had various guest on that talk in part talk talk to the school security issue i was struck by the fact that there appears to be very little or inadequate communication between these various groups and because of that inadequate communication we're having problems things that should be discussed behind and in a productive meeting uh they're instead they're being thrown on the airways uh, perhaps uh, to achieve greater traction i'm not sure what but let me give you two or three examples uh the sheriff was on and uh on wednesday and said some things that uh, could be quite disturbing. For one thing, he said the school is not moving fast enough to harden our our buildings. And he said he's getting tired of waiting. He said he's not the only one getting tired of waiting. He could see some parents being armed across the street from the schools to protect the children. Now, that that image alone is frightening. Uh, he, uh, he then he went on to say certain things were being done that were, uh, uh, for example, uh, latches that should be replaced. Instead of latches being replaced, they're providing paint to paint over the surface. Uh, this does not paint a picture of of the school being responsive to the uh, uh, to the work that they should be doing as far as school security. The flip side of the equation: the school board came on the next day, uh, and along with the superintendent, and basically took the position that the sheriff did not follow the appropriate uh, administrative chain, uh, letting them know, alerting them there, there were problems. What they, they did not do was to counter some of the charges that the sheriff made. These two together leaves one to believe that we are vulnerable in our schools. Uh, taking it one step farther, uh, the, uh, uh, Mike Hornby was on, uh, mentioned that the, the state has given some money for, uh, for the schools statewide that it was presented in the vein of security, school security. Well, the, ca- the, the funding was from, for, for cameras, which is probably very important, especially in the light of what we had uh, with the special ed a couple so years ago. But that is not high in the priority of what the schools need. What I think is missing is a sit-down more than one sit down, several sit downs of all the interesting parties, the county, the schools, the school board, the sheriff's department, the, our, our legislators, to map out a plan of what can and should be done to ensure that our schools are safe for our children. But I'm not seeing that happen. So my question is, uh, have we lost communication among among the various parts, do we have adequate communication among the various elements to ensure safety in the schools? And uh, clarify one point, Bill, in yeah. regards to the uh, hinges and paint, yeah. and uh, the way that that played out in the conversation was Sheriff Harmon was talking about hinges and a door, a security door that needed repaired, and what happened was the school delivered twelve thousand dollars worth of paint for the hallways. It was not to paint over the hinges to make them look better. It was a separate issue from a separate order. He was he was making the comparison that there should be money to fix the door, but instead there was money budgeted for paint. 
that was the point he was making on but that. But that, that was clarified more the second day, I Correct. Thought. Okay. Yeah, so I, I want to start with Delegate Mike Height, who has uh, discussed these issues in Charleston while in session in regards to school security and such. Michael. Well, there has been a lot of discussion um, of how we make our schools safe and, and uh, especially the entrance ways um, that we need to do something. We need to make them more secure in, in different ways. Um, but my opinion is a lot of this is just um, superficial. This is lipstick on a pig. Um, what we need to do is it probably each one of these schools have an independent uh, contractor go in and uh, do an assessment. Um, are they safe? And what would it take to make them safer than what they are right now? If there was a mass shooting, let's let's be honest. If there was a mass shooting in Berkeley County right now, pick a school. There's nothing that would be there to stop it. Uh, if you study these schools, if you look at these schools, you could have a mass shooting right now. All of these schools have outbuildings um, that don't have the same level of security. Just wait till the bell rings. All the doors open up. Um, you can gain access to the, the buildings if you need to if or if you wanted to. You can wait till the students are outside. Um, you could have mass shootings. And you can have all these security measures, and you can have an incidence where you had at the elementary school, I believe, in Texas, where somebody just propped the door open because they were bringing stuff in and out, of, uh, and they propped the door open. And, and there's the level of security gone right there. You, you've allowed somebody that, that wants to do harm to gain access. And you can do that at, at any one of these schools. And, you know, as a printer, I go around to a lot of the schools and, and, and deliver stuff to them. And some of them are very good. To, you have to get in the front door and they have to buzz you in. They have to see who you are. And there's a level of security before you go to the next set of doors. So there is a, a certain level of security. But go around to the back of the building. Go around to the side of the building. Any number of doors could be opened or you could just knock on the door and somebody will come in and open it and say hello well once they open it your level of security is gone not to mention the outbuildings i don't know that the outbuildings have any security at all do they lock the doors once kids go in for the, their classroom setting when the bell rings and kids are coming in and out of the the buildings and and these these uh these trailers i mean there's there's hundreds of them out there so if you wanted to have a mass shooting right now in Berkeley County, there is nothing there to stop it. And locks on doors are not going to stop it either. We have to get to a point where we don't have trailers outside. And we don't have people. There needs to be additional training for people inside of buildings. You just can't open a door because somebody's knocking on it. So I, I, don't, I don't know... I don't know that more money is going to solve this problem. It would provide SROs, though. The SROs would be would be nice, but again, an SRO is just going to be somebody who can respond quickly once the shooting starts. Not if the SRO is on site as a regular job. Correct, but even even on site, they have to respond to where the shooting is. So let's assume the shooter goes around to the back of the building and the SRO is at the front of the building where the main entrance is and the shooting starts around how much how much shooting goes on before the SRO can respond to where the shooting's going now granted it's nice to have an SRO there who can who can stop it as soon as possible mm -hmm. you're not waiting you know 10 15 minutes for somebody to show up that they can respond right away because they're on site no doubt about it that's that's a good thing but i don't know that that's the what our sheriff wants i think he wants i don't know that he wants an sro in every school he wants sort of like a, a roaming sro that can go to multiple schools well that doesn't help you at any one school well, i think if you ask nate ideally would he take oh, one yes. at every school i think he'd take that For sure. he, he said that yes yeah absolutely uh uh Go to you, Joe Ferretti, via telephone. Well, these the school shootings are, are are a cancer in society, and, and when you treat cancer, we, we don't we haven't eradicated cancer. We try to mitigate the harm as best we can with various therapies and treatments, 
designed to, to prolong life even if you have the cancer. And such is the case with, with, with the gun violence in our society. We're trying to come up with ways to mitigate the harm. We're not going to eradicate it, but we got to deal with it the best way we can to lessen the impact on our schools and our society. And, and the idea of SROs and hardening schools and all that are, are designed to do exactly that. The, the, but the takeaway I have from listening to the interviews on the show the last two days was that there seems to be a lack of communication or a communication breakdown between two important principles in this effort to mitigate harm in our schools, and that is the school board and the school administration and law enforcement, local law enforcement. There seems to be uh, some kind of lack of communication, and it, and it was symptomatic in, in the way it was, the issue of keys was raised. Uh, does the sheriff have all the keys he needs or not? to enter the school when he might have to. Uh, th- there was some debate over whether, you know, what the fact was with regard to that simple issue. So uh, as a parent in Berkeley County, if I had students still in our school systems, I would be demanding of these elected officials, the sheriff, the Board of Education folks, I would be demanding that they exhibit that there is communication ongoing and that it is fruitful in order to make our schools as safe as possible. And right now, my confidence is shaken in that. Yeah, the keys issue you're referring to, Joe, is uh, Jackie Long, the vice president of the board, referring to the fact that uh, Sheriff Harmon had said he needed a key for every school, didn't have them, and Jackie saying that he had 66 of them. So, by the way, Sheriff Harmon has texted me and requested to be on the program next Wednesday, which we have scheduled for, I believe, 9.05. Mike Carl. Well, first of all, since our firm does a lot of work for school boards, including Berkeley, I'm not going to acknowledge any fault on their end. But I do strongly encourage communication among all the players involved to, because this is, I mean, we have secure public buildings, you know, selected ones, uh, but this whole uh, move of widening the the shooting violence to schools, you know, requires uh, a, a different reaction than just business as usual. So I, I agree that there needs to be, you know, upgrades and everybody involved needs to play their role. And uh, Bill's question again in regards to the communication between the two entities, Larry Schultz. Um, yes, the communication cannot take place on a radio talk show. Right. You can't have the sheriff on one day to say, well, these people from the school board, blah, 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 and then have the school board people on. So, well, that's not really true. That's not communication. That'll take place, and we'll never know about it. They'll meet with one another privately and go through a list and an agenda of plans. That being said, you still have no guarantee. In other words, the level of security at a typical public school in Berkeley County will never remotely approach the level of security that um, a federal building has. Well, that a federal building has, that our state legislature has. Um, be awful hard. You'd have to shoot your way into our legislature to get there. And that's just not true with most schools all over the country. Um, because, for obvious reasons, there's a big security interest. Uh, there's no there's no question about that and, at legislatures. And, and there's 89 Republicans there. You'd have to shoot your way back out. Okay, so they're all armed? Not I saying they are. I thought that was against the law. Not saying they are. Not saying they're not. Okay. Uh, you know, the thing is, You're saying a lot of people who do these things don't care if they die. So the idea that we're going to put a big imposing thing out front that makes you say, well, if you come in here, we're going to shoot you. They don't care. I mean, a a lot of the shooters end up dead. They obviously know that's a risk. They don't care. They're coming in to shoot. For some of them, that's their goal. Yeah, it's, you know, they used to talk about a thing called suicide by cop. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty much what that is. Um, You know, and so it's not a, it's not an easy thing to resolve and I don't pretend that it is because if someone is willing to shoot their way into the building then against almost any kind of force they could on the right day have a certain amount of success 
Um, and I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you how we could possibly afford to arm our schools the way our state capital is armed. And of course, if that happens, it won't stop. They'll just go somewhere else. Well, our state Stores, capital only, hospitals. There's only a couple of guards at two entrances. I mean, there's like four guards in the state capital. I mean, there, there's not a whole lot of of uh, when you say our state capital is is secured. You know, not a whole lot. Maybe more than we know. You think? Well, there's probably campus security <laughs> in, in places we don't see, but at the entrances, there, there's four. So is there something, is this, this campus security at the Capitol, Capitol security, are they down on other levels and could respond? Possibly, yes. And I, you know, I've never gone in the state Capitol without going through a metal detector. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, pretty basic. Imagine that at every door into a school. Ay, 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 how, how expensive would that be? It's well, and that's outrageous. the other thing. How, how many... How many doors can you come into at the state capitol? Where as a school, there's many doors to go in and out, and and they're not secured like the, they are at the capitol. Yeah, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, we all recognize we're never going to get a hundred percent assurance that we will not have a, um, a disaster attack. But that's no excuse not to plan and not to work together. And what we have, what I don't think we have had, and I hope we will see in the future, is that all the interested parties get together and do an intense review of where we are and what we need to do, take into account the monies available. Issue number three, Michael Height. All right. I talked a little bit about the ERJ earlier, so I'm going to skip over that one and go to another one. Um, And my question is, now that we have a Kennedy in the Democratic race, will that impact uh, Joe Biden's run for uh, a a 2024 presidential run? Um, And how much impact will the Kennedy have? President Biden's supposed to deliver his intention to run via uh, video uh, in the very near future. I heard that this morning on the network news. Bill Stubblefield, you're up first. I don't think this Kennedy is even going to get the vote of the Kennedy family. He is a <laughs> he is an outcast. He is a he's viewed as a laughing stock. So no, I don't think it's going to influence anyone. If the Democrat, if the uh, Republicans are putting their hopes on. This Kennedy getting the primary, so be an easy target, they're dreaming because it's never going to happen. I bet he doesn't get more than a tenth of 1% or a hundredth of 1%. That is marginally low, Mr. That's Carl. marginally low. Uh, I, I find myself uh, in reluctant agreement with Mr. <laughs> Stubblefield. <laughs> I, I, I did. Hey, don't forget about the I reluctant mean, Mike. The name, the name Kennedy, you know, is a big deal, but this is individual is not a big deal. No. Mr. Schultz. And it has been a long time since the name Kennedy was a really big deal. And, uh, you know, the, I was uh, two when John F. Kennedy was elected, and I'm 65 now. So there's been an awful lot of people, you know, kids my daughter's age, let's say, they know who John F. Kennedy was and they know who the Kennedys were, but they're not looking at these Kennedys as being like those Kennedys. Especially and apparently even Kennedy. the Kennedys aren't looking at it this guy <laughs> this way. It's, uh, it's, it's been an interesting drop-off in the generations, uh, to say the least. Mr. Ferretti. Well, uh, uh, the, just so we understand, this is Robert Kennedy's son and... Um, yeah, his uh, siblings and other family members have kind of disowned him on a lot of issues, including his uh, claiming that the erection of 5G towers in this country is a government plot to harvest data and control our minds. And and uh, I mean, he, he's been out there on, on some some really wacky conspiracy theories. I think he talked about the anthrax uh, attacks on the Senate back in the uh, Bush administration was a, the means to get the Patriot Act passed, and it was a CIA plot. So, I, you know, I, I don't see him having any influence, and I don't think I don't – more importantly, I don't see him encouraging others to take on Joe Biden. Uh, I, I secretly hope that somebody will. Uh, I think there needs to be 
a vetting and a challenge on that side of the 2024 presidential ticket, as well as uh, uh, a challenge that I hope materializes on the Republican side, uh, because I think uh, another Biden-Trump rerun is, is going to be very damaging for this country. I, we really need a proper vetting of those two individuals, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is not the guy to do that. Back to you, Mr. Height. Uh, unfortunately, I agree as well. Uh, I don't think this is the guy that's going to make a difference. Um, I would agree with Joe. I, I really would like to see uh, a, a reasonable Democrat come out and, and run against Biden. Um, I, I don't think Biden's up to the job. Um, I, I think that becomes apparent every time he speaks. So I would I would like to see somebody um, from the the Democrat machine come out and run against him and be a viable candidate. Uh, is it a Joe Manchin, somebody like that? Um, I would hope so. Somebody that's, in my opinion, more moderate. But you have to have somebody that's that's coherent too. And what we have right now isn't. Any final thoughts? All right, we move on then to issue number three with issue number four, Larry Schultz. Uh, yeah, um, Form Energy, uh, which is the recent recipient of a $300 million promise or grant from the state of West Virginia to build a battery uh, plant, an energy storage system plant uh, in Weirton, West Virginia. It turns out they're a Massachusetts company. And I was looking at some of their um, policies and procedures, and they keep close statistics on the gender distribution of their uh, workforce, including people they describe as non-binary. So they have a certain percentage of men, a certain percentage of women, and uh, a certain percentage, I think pretty much 1%, uh, non-binary. And I don't have a problem with that. Folks are in the country who describe themselves in different ways and who have different viewpoints of human um, gender. But it strikes me as odd um, that they would want to come to West Virginia, which hasn't shown recently a lot of wokeness, um, to use the Ron DeSantis term. And my question for the panel is, is Forum Energy too woke? For West Virginia. Well, let's start with the member of the House of Delegates who could answer that question first, Mr. Heights. <laughs> well, let me first start by saying it's two hundred and ninety million, not three hundred million. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes a big difference. He's leading with the power hit. Oh boy. And and they have gotten grants from the federal government, which reduces that number significantly. Anything they get from the federal government comes off of that $290 million. So that $290 million is is drastically lower now. Um, as, as far as the woke, uh, this, I know this may be hard for you to believe, but most Republicans just don't care. Okay? If, if you're man- woman, non-binary, if you are a horse, if you can do the job, we don't care. Just hire people to come in and perform the task. As long as they can do the task, we don't care. If you want to identify as non-binary, I still want you to have a job. I don't want you living off the system. So whatever you identify as, come in, go to work, do your eight, 12 whatever hours and then go home i just don't want you throwing it in my face all the time just go to work so we really don't care so if if this particular company wants to come in and say we have to hire so many non-binary individuals my guess is you're going to have trouble because if if you need to get a certain percentage you also have to hit that that, that number of 750 employees that is required by the state of West Virginia to get that money. So I don't think there's probably enough non-binary people out there that are going to be looking for jobs at Form Energy to hit that quota unless it's a very, very, very small quota. So I just don't care. I don't think Larry's saying they had a quota. I, I think just in a general survey, 
They've right. There, that there, there has been talk of them having a quota, but I don't know that that's true, and I'm not going to accuse them of having well, yeah, any. I, I, you're not, how, how would you know? You're not allowed to ask those questions on a job interview. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but they, they, the way they gathered the stats, I take it, is they asked their already existing employees, yes, the 314 guess. people mm-hmm. who work for them now in Somerville, Massachusetts. It just struck me as odd that of all the places where you might go and and i would say to mike i appreciate that you do feel that way what if we put that viewpoint to a vote in the house of delegates do you really think that a majority would say i don't care yes a majority a majority of republicans yes Okay, and would it be a sweeping majority or just like 51 40? Yes, it, it would be a sweeping majority of Republicans would say, we just don't care. Are there idiots at the legislature? Yep. <laughs> on both sides. Just not as many on the other side because there's just not as many on the other just side. Not, right. The percentage is higher. The percentage. Though. It's a smaller pool. <laughs> There's only 10 members of that pool this morning. Mr. Stumblefield. I agree totally with uh, Mike Height. I just fault form energy and anyone else that makes an issue of this yes by putting in by categorizing there's one job to do and get the job done the sexual preference or how they identify to me should not ever be an issue i think they probably published that as a way of showing how inclusive they are if indeed that's the reason for the survey sure. so that they wouldn't exactly. get banged on by a special interest group saying they're discriminatory against non-binary people i'm thinking corporations across america probably are doing this all over the place yeah yes. then we we fault uh, larry schultz for not picking this subtlety up and uh and mention that as a qualifier in our discussion larry just wanted to antagonize height with that <laughs> well, question I, that was I, all about that i just find it to be a perfect inside out question it's just perfect <laughs> What did you mean by that as an inside-out question? Uh, Yeah, a question that I would ask that um, maybe some of the people who feel differently than I would would be somewhat afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. But I have no fear of asking it because I don't. I, just I absolutely don't. Interesting choice of words considering the, the theme of the question. Sure. All right, let's, let's, go, to, let's go to Mr. Ferretti. Well, I, I, of course, uh, I agree with Mike Height, and, and I do so hoping that his voice will resonate with a certain Florida governor who we see every day trying to dictate to a private business how they're supposed to think. Uh, you know, this is a, this guy purportedly uh, one of the leading candidates for president on the Republican side, and we watch this constant harangue from him about Disney. And it, it isn't that just rich? given that he's a so-called conservative, trying to dictate to a private business how they're supposed to feel about certain societal issues that have nothing to do with business. So I, 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 to me, uh, Mike Heist's correct. I hope most people don't care. Uh, and I'll add as a side note, uh, Mike's point about how our $290 million investment may decrease because of federal money coming in we can thank the Inflation Reduction Act for that money. Good point. Mike, would you like to credit Joe Biden right now? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Joe Manchin. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carl. Well, I, I agree with virtually everything that's been said, said about this. Uh, and just to add, uh, I've, I've already recommended the vote on that bill to approve the state's support uh, to be one of the key votes in the EPBA rating of legislators and, you know, a, a plus vote. So, so uh, and, and that's what, that's what happened. And, and I don't know if they uh, were aware of this issue. Uh, I don't know it's an issue, uh, but I, I totally agree with Mike Height that, that if they were, it would still been overwhelmingly approved. It's interesting with your EPBA angle on that, Mike, as a positive for conservatives to vote in this particular case for form energy. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it's irrelevant. It, it's a new. It's a neutral. Because other 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 conservative uh, organizations that have rated delegates who voted on that have counted that against them as a conservative uh, vote. Well, the, the the EPBA will be out to counter that. And yours is a very conservative organization. Yes. Well, it it believes in 
free enterprise system and not worrying about these, you know, identity issues in terms of the functioning of the free enterprise. Back to you, Mr. Schultz. Um, I, I think it is an interesting thing. You know, we we are a group of, of men of a certain age, and we don't necessarily every single day have a lot of uh, back and forth with people who are in this way different from us. And it is time uh, in this country that we all become more accepting. I applaud Form Energy, actually, for putting that in their statistics and saying, look, if you're a trans person and you can do the job, we'll hire you. We've done it already and we'll do it again. People who have these identity problems and are being discriminated against in other parts of their life don't need to fail to get a job because... um, people are prejudiced or uh, d- can't imagine how that can possibly be all the things that we hear people of our age group saying about this every day and and so yes it's a great thing i hope they're not too woke for west virginia because if they're coming here i want them to succeed as does the legislature which has bucked up to the form of uh, nine figures to make sure that they do mr carl issue number five the, the, the last one is, what has been the effect of the Democrats uh, sort of s- s- slow walking all the uh, investigations and charges against Trump? You know, we're still waiting for Georgia to do something, and there's others, I, I understand. Is that good or bad for the Democrats? And, and the recent data shows, shows uh, huge uh, uh, contribution increases from Trump. Uh, you know, per, connected to 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 the, to this uh, attack on these attacks on him, uh, but I, and, and the polling shift we've heard recently, but I, it, that that undermines or that just further makes me skeptical of polling the the accuracy of polling. I don't I don't think that I mean Trump's been you know under attack and you know threatened with with prosecution. For you know, ever since he lost the election, and and I don't think that's you know that all of a sudden you know these formal charges are going to change the people's support or reluctance to support him. I will say, uh, if he if <laughs> big if he's the Republican nominee, I will support him, Mr. Ferrante. Wow, I'm surprised, Mike. Um, <laughs> I, well, I, I think. You know, I've read where uh, there's some theory out there that the Democrats are playing three-level chess here and that the idea is to make Trump, Trump the uh, – I almost said chump uh, – make Trump the <laughs> – Actually, you did speed. say chump. Actually, he did say chump. Yeah. <laughs> Freudian slip there. You can run back the replay on that. I do have confirmation that you did call him chump. Yeah. I, hey. I should end it right there. (laughs) Uh, There's some theory out there that the Democrats are going to make him the presumptive nominee, and he is so fatally flawed that uh, that's who they want to run against in 2024. But I I, I don't think it's purposeful. I I know from following very closely what's going on in Georgia that the grand jury has pretty much wrapped up their work. They have already reported to the prosecutor uh, who they want to – uh, or who they support indicting. And uh, I, I think the problem in Georgia is it's going to be more than Trump. So uh, they, the prosecutor's got a lot of work yet to make sure that uh, everything is presented appropriately when you have multiple people who are facing indictments. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to hear who those other folks are. Uh, as for what's going on with Jack Smith and, and the uh, document issue at Mar-a-Lago, uh, I, you know, Reports are that's going to be months yet before they issue out any indictment. So bottom line is it just grinds on. I think that's just part of the criminal justice system at, at work. Uh, it never proceeds uh, as quickly as we would like. But uh, overall, uh, yeah, he's raising a ton of money. Uh, you know, there, there's no end to the, uh, uh, I guess, the, the fleecing of the American public in, in terms of supporting him because all this money is going to his criminal defense and his attorney. Uh, the, the money he's raising is not all campaign money governed by uh, finance laws with, with our elections. 
this some of this money is just going to in his pocket. And so he'll continue to grind on, too, in defending these cases and filing motions and, and delay, 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 which always favors the defendant in criminal cases. So uh, nothing's going to happen quickly, but uh, it's clear that it's only empowering him as far as 2024. Admiral, yeah, it's uh, your perspective, uh, perspective, whether it's uh, a slow walk on the part of the uh, Democrats or not. Uh, legal process takes time, uh, and you want to do it right. I think most folks would say they would much rather for the prosecutors to come in with a solid case than doing it prematurely. Uh, and I also would like to believe that the prosecutors are not considering the political implications. Uh, they may, I don't know, uh, but I would hope they would not. I see these as two separate, uh, two separate but parallel paths. One, the prosecution, and second, the political uh, uh, run. Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting times. I, I wonder if the prosecutor, uh, it should be, I think, uh, Mike's Carl uh, ask about the Democrats. I think the issue resides more the Republicans. What are the Republicans viewing in the primary? Are they viewing these uh, uh, these legal ch uh, challenges to Trump as reason to vote for him or reasons to vote for someone else? Um, and you say you don't like the polls, Mike, uh, right now, and the polls do vary. Right now, uh, uh, Trump is thumping uh, DeSantis by pretty big numbers, but that can change overnight. So the question, I don't know if it has a real implication, a real uh, impact and all. Mr. Height. I'm going to disagree a little bit with Bill. I don't know how you can say that the prosecutors, uh, there's there's no uh, no bias here and, and no, um, no politics here when the, I said I hope. I said I hope. The prosecuting <laughs> attorney ran his his campaign platform was I'm going to take Trump to the cleaners. I'm going to prosecute him. Well, I don't know how much more political that can get. I mean, this was this was a case that the his predecessor refused to prosecute on and he didn't. Once he got elected, he didn't for for the longest time. He waited and waited and waited. The are, are the Dems slow rolling this? You bet they are slow rolling this. For political reasons, they are slow rolling this. Well, what's going on in Georgia? I, again, it seems like, you know, it's been two years and now it's just going to come out. You know, the whole thing, the the season of, of, of stuff down in Mar-a-Lago, now it's going to come out. It, it just seems the timing with all of these things, you know, it – there, there's I, I'm not conspiracy theorist, but sometimes when the evidence is there, it's it's not a conspiracy theory if it's true. But let me let me ask the the lawyers in the room here: has has some of this timing also been the part of the Trump legal team and Trump himself in terms of delay tactic tactics? I mean, this well, information hasn't exactly been handed over quickly by his team over the years. No, right? I mean, uh, I think there's a very good point that that. He's slow walked it the way he slow walks every lawsuit that's ever filed against him. He's never out front demanding a trial tomorrow. Uh, the other point, though, is we um, have never, ever indicted a former president. The Justice Department, even to this day, has a standing rule that they will not prosecute a sitting president. Which, when you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous. And some friends of mine and I were talking about it, and, and a friend of mine who will remain nameless came up with what we call the Wolf Blitzer theory, which is the President of the United States, either party, is having an interview with Wolf Blitzer, and Wolf Blitzer says something he doesn't like, so the President pulls a gun out of the desk and shoots him on live TV. We're not going to indict the guy? He just committed a murder on national television. I understand of Wolf is not real happy died. about that example. Yeah, um, but uh, I tried to pick the the guy least likely to say something. <laughs> yeah, but but so it it is a slow roll by necessity because you're doing something that is not just unprecedented in the courts; it's absolutely unprecedented in the history of the country. And so to say, well, they're slow walking it. I would slow walk it, not for electoral advantage, but because I don't want to be the guy who loses this case. 
if I'm the prosecutor. If I indict the former president for the first time in American history, I want to make sure my ducks are lined up and marching solidly toward the toward the outcome. Uh, and if you you know that takes time um, because things can change overnight when a new witness pops up and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I don't see it as particularly um, delay ridden or difficult. It's really unprecedented. Joe, I heard you making hey, noise Bob, over there. Yeah, let me. Yeah, let me speak to uh, the situation in Georgia, which I, I know a little bit about. Uh, the prosecutor there is named Sandy Willis, and. She made her bones as a prosecutor indicting teachers and the teachers union in one of the county school districts here in Georgia for a cheating scandal regarding standardized tests. That's how she got her her start in her career. Uh, So uh, those who might think it's it's all political uh, should look at her background and history. Uh, I, I think she has exhibited that she prosecutes without fear or favor. And her effort down here is delayed in part, as you suggested, Rob, because of the many filings by not only Donald Trump, but others like Lindsey Graham, who fought for months a deposition that was scheduled by Fannie Willis because of the speech and debate clause defense that Senator Graham raised and and, and why he shouldn't be compelled to testify. He lost that in court and he had to come to Atlanta and testify. And that's been happening with other witnesses because the theory is that a lot of Trump uh, people in the White House are also facing the possibility of indictment, including Mark Meadows, because Trump was not the only one who made phone calls to election officials here in Georgia about the election. So uh, I I think that that far ranging and, and, and very wide analysis by this prosecutor as to who might have committed uh, felonies here in the state of Georgia is what's, at least in that case, necessitating more than, than just a few months to wrap up. But, Joe, your argument is always about the Georgia case. What What is your opinion of the New York case? There's there's no po- political issues going on there? Well, I, I understand that the, the, the uh, argument about, you know, George Soros being behind this prosecutor and all. But, and look, I, I can tell you that many people – were disappointed that that is the lead case against Donald Trump. And while it, it's still an indictment, it's still a felony, uh, many legal observers feel eventually it's going to be a misdemeanor and it's not going to be jail time and he's probably going to pay a fine and that's going to be the end of it. Uh, it that, that was not the, the case that a lot of folks wanted to go forward if you want to see Donald Trump held accountable. Uh, as to the, the mindset as to what caused that case to be filed first. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what's in Alvin Bragg's mind, what motivates him. Surely he could be criticized because he campaigned on the very issue, as you as you said. Uh, but, and so he leaves himself open to that. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I can understand the argument, Mike, that, that that could be a little more political than some of these other uh, problems that the ex-president is facing. The uh, Georgia situation and the phone call, Joe, where we hear President Trump ask to have 12, what was the number, 14,000 or 12,000 votes found, whatever the number was. 11,789. That was a perfect phone call. I heard him say it. Perfect phone yeah. call. Uh, that, that sentence and that question in and of itself doesn't, doesn't to me, in, in, imply guilt on the person. Because you, you can take it different ways. You can say, listen, I, I'm sure these votes are out there, and I don't think they've been counted properly. I need you to find them. That's that's one way of looking at it. That's that's a way of defending the question. But I, I understand, Joe, that when you listen further on the conversations for the full however many minutes it was, and there were many of them there, 40 minutes, whatever it was, uh, there's a lot more to it that kind of continues to open up that onion a bit more. Yeah, I've read the full transcript of that perfect phone call, uh, quote-unquote, and and – there was a threat made by President Trump that Secretary of State Raffensperger could be facing criminal liability if he didn't follow through with looking for those votes. That kind of threat coming from a sitting president cannot be tolerated and clearly violates laws. So, uh, yeah, it's more than just 
this open-ended argument about what did the president mean by finding votes. Uh, the explicit and implicit threats made from the, uh, the White House is what's going to be more problematic. Final 30 seconds of this conversation ends with Mike Carl. I'll uh, appreciate all the good points made. I think the New York case blows up. I think the Georgia case pins Trump. But the timing of those outcomes versus the election process is completely up in the air.